And our speaker today is Sarah Turnbull, who is a qualified practice, practice and registered geologist with more than six years experience in the exploration and mining fields. She has multi-commodity experience and is a competent person or qualified professional in alluvial gemstones, graphite, vanadium and coal. She has also been involved in several other commodities, including onshore gas, manganese, gold, heavy mineral sands and phosphate in Mozambique, South Africa and Zimbabwe. She has a geology degree from the University of Johannesburg and is currently doing a PhD in economic geology part-time at the University of the Witwatersrand. And today, Sarah is going to tell us about her experiences in the field. All yours, Sarah. Alrighty, well, thank you. Um, I, I presume that um, you guys can hear me because often with teams, no one can. So luckily, Nolene has gone and um, helped me with that. So that's the case. I'm just going to stop sharing my video just to save some bandwidth while, while I start. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself and yeah, here we go. So um, firstly, thank you very much for having me. And um, what I, how I wanted to start my talk was with a disclaimer because with all the previous talks, they also started with a disclaimer. So I wanted one too. Um, so it, um, when Nolene originally approached me to give this talk, I was really hesitant and um, I wasn't entirely sure that, that I, I was capable of doing it because with all the previous talks, They've been very experienced geos. And um, I wasn't sure that I was quite in the same league as everyone else. And additionally, along with that, um, I felt that a lot of the experiences that I've had have been with all these, these heavyweights and, and all these amazing experienced geos. So um, I felt like it would be a retelling of a story that they've already lived. So um, I, I thought about it um, because Nolene cornered me in a, in a GSSA meeting and in front of everyone <laughs> volunteered myself. And um, so I, I thought about it again and I thought that I, I wouldn't mind giving a talk, but instead of having a very specialized and technical talk um, about a specific deposit, which I can do in the future, um, because it's Women's Month and I am a geologist and in a male dominated field, um, I wanted to, to talk um, predominantly about the experiences that I've had and basically highlights all the amazing geologists that I've worked with and try my best to encourage both the younger generation and the older generation to, to really work on a, a mentorship program with one another. Um, I, I have really been surrounded by great and knowledgeable people, both um, sort of on the same level as peers as me, as well as working under them and um, just they've been able to instill so much, instill and encourage so much um, passion in geology for me. And that's basically what I'm trying to, to do is, is show what they've, they've taught me and encourage everyone else to, to give back in some way or the other. Um, field geology is really awesome, but it's also really tough. So um, with, with all the amazing CPs, I really feel that they've kept up a really great standard and in order for for us in the field to carry on keeping up that standard that we should take part in training one another and and spending time with one another and just learning from each other and that's actually the main reason why I agreed to doing this talk even though I wasn't 100% sure to begin with. Um, so with regards to this little uh, sort of joke here on the right hand side, they were quite popular about 10 years ago and um, I went and I found a few and sort of made my own little one and they all end up with um, what I actually do. I forgot which one. And this is, um, this I is, that's what the, the, um, the icon says is what I actually do is, is the drinking. But what I've now done and, and from what I've, I've seen is you hurry up and wait. There's been um, so many projects that I've been on where everything is, you know, good to go and guns are blazing and everyone's happy and then the driller goes and loses the bit down the hole. Or you're waiting on sampling equipment or you're waiting for the rigs to come across the border. So with my experience, it really has been one extreme or the other. You're either sitting around and, and waiting for 
for something to happen or like I say, it, it, it is guns blazing. So with my talk, I hope that um, a few of you guys can relate and that in, and in general, it brings some um, information to, to you guys. So the first CP that I was exposed to or the first person that I, I got um, to spend time with was Tanya. And um, so I was fresh out of university and I, I really was quite disappointed now looking back at it that I didn't take as many photos or sort of document it as well as I could have. And unfortunately with my, my images, I had to rely on, on um, Tanya's LinkedIn profile to, to get a photo of her. And um, so, so that's the one thing is that I wish I had taken more photos of that trip. But um, what I can really, um, I, what I, I really rely on uh, heavily is from Tanya was the, 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 just the general, um, her practice and, and how professional she was and what a fantastic foundation she gave me with regards to the codes and, and everything that we as geologists have to stick by. And um, even six years later, I still call on that information that's, that's back in the back of my memory. So that, that's really helped me a hell of a lot. And then, um, then with regards to Tanya, not only um, is she amazing because she's this, this powerhouse in, in a male dominated industry, but also <laughs> she uh, traveled with me all the way from, from site to Maputo and then to Nelspruit in this little helicopter over here. And I get really quite sick. And um, the previous day before we did this trip, I, I, I did actually, I was sick on one of the other geos. So um, she was really, she took it in her stride and she went and, and went with it. So just here on the left, this was um, the, the diamond site that, that I worked on. And um, this is how we actually got to site, was crossing the, the mighty Limpopo on this little pontoon. So that was us. And here's our gravels. Oh, shame. And this is Jose, who, who shared the unfortunate helicopter trip with me. Um, with regards to the, the alluvial project, I just want to give a little bit of background. Um, we were looking for alluvial diamonds and um, the project was in its early stages. So we were based over here in Mozambique on the Save River, just on the border of Zim and uh, Mozambique. And the, the whole theory was that there were diamonds in the Kimberl uh, the Marangi diamond fields over here had been washed down with the Save River and had then been deposited um, here on, on, on the, the concessions that we worked um, on, which was close to Mavui. It was a great theory because it was coming from sort of a higher elevation and here at the Mozambican levels, the, um, the elevation decreased and in theory, the um, river was supposed to drop its load with all the diamonds and um, here was our, our concession. So um, you could see that it was seriously a, a very abraded river and um, so that's what we were then sort of started to prospect for was looking for these diamonds in these gravel beds. Um, with regards to the exploration and processing techniques, we had eight trial pits and we were targeting a single gravel unit that was placed on a hard calcrete layer. Um, with, with, dime, or with alluvial diamonds specifically, you don't assay any of the work, so it's all um, trial sampling or bulk sampling. And what happened was we would put it through this barrel screen and it would um, size out all the material that was over here. It would, oh sorry, over here, it would size out all the foot, uh, greater than 40 millimeters and here all the, the finer material. And um, we would then take the, the sweet material or the, the right size between, uh, it was five, uh, 10 mm and 40 mm and we would then put it into these two rotary pans to then get a concentrate. Once we then tapped the concentrate off, we would then feed it into these jigs. And um, you can't really see it, but there were five um, sieves, uh, no, six sieves that were in this, this jig specifically. And it would bounce up and down and then size the fraction for us. And we would then throw it onto a sorting table. There were always two people at a time and generally an additional security member as well. And we would then sort to see what diamonds that we could find. So in summary, um, I just really wanted to give a brief um, overview of what we did. And um, unfortunately, the grades that we recovered was just not economic. And um, what I had been exposed to was a whole lot of learning that's, that I really 
hadn't had any experience in with regards to being in university. And there was one, there was a very, very serious um, uh, meeting that we had had. And um, we had been in it for quite some time. And Tanya had really put down a series of presentations and conclusions and a number of concepts that she was trying to get through to everyone. And um, as much as she would try, there would just be a number of people that kept on saying to her, but you know, I feel that we can carry on. I can, I, I feel that, that there's, there's potential, I feel. And um, Tanya had spent so much time trying to explain it to this, this crowd. And eventually Tanya said, um, well, I think you should go feel yourself somewhere else because unfortunately science dictates to you and that's what we have to do. We have to stick by science. And um, six years later, I think that that's one of the, the major things that stuck with me is that as much as you'd like to try and help people and as much as your feelings get involved, it really is science that dictates to us. And um, when I've been stuck in a little tent in the middle of nowhere and, and people are putting pressure on you to do certain things, that's, that's the whole, I just keep on remembering, thinking, okay, well, go feel yourself somewhere else. We, we have to listen to science. So from there, I then started working with um, Rian Mouton and um, he's a geophysicist. We moved from the Diamond Project onto the, a graphite project. And what um, Rian really instilled into me was, you can either have it done quickly or you can have it done right, but you can't have it done both ways. And again, very often in industry, and I think in a, in a lot of places, you often asked, can you just quickly do a mine plan? Can you just quickly write up a CPR? Can you just quickly? And um, very often that, that is what people ask you to do, but you will always have to compromise on one. You can't just quickly. And um, so that's really stuck with me from Rion. With regards to the project, um, we were working up here in Montsopoish. And so we used to fly all the way up to Pemba and there was about a 200, a 200 kilometer drive to Montepoix. And um, that's where we started looking at, at the graphite project. Um, what we did know was that there were other companies that had gone and specifically mentioned mineralization. So we, uh, Rian suggested that we work perpendicular to the strike um, to, to work at EM34 lines and see what anomalies we could find. We were very fortunate in that we did have a number of anomalies. And so we just took a RC rig up there while well, there was an RC rig available. And um, we were able to drill just some, some um, scouting holes to see was there, was these, were these anomalies related to the mineralization, which um, it then confirmed that it did. With that information, the, the company was then able to go to markets and raise enough capital to then have an airborne survey um, flown. And Rion then did all the processing and was able to provide us with a number of different ranked anomalies that we were then able to go and test and validate. So um, next comes Johan. So Johan has really been a fantastic mentor for me and he's really taught me so much um, specifically about field geology and exploration in both coal and graphite. Um, and here, over here, we, <laughs> we were stuck on site and one of the guys had been fiddling with the downhole water pump that was in our borehole and I, I don't know what happened, but there went our borehole, uh, or there went our pump down the borehole so we couldn't get water anymore. So Johan made this plan, we, we'd had rain so we carried on poking all the holes here to try and get some water. So we, he always taught me to, to make a plan. And um, yeah, just in the background, this was our, our drilling camp when we, we stayed with the drillers. Um, these were our guys that used to cut our lines for us, for us to get access to, to the drill pads. So with regards to, to going back to the geophysics, um, we had these, these ranked um, anomalies and sort of what, MORC1 uh, related to the, the rank one, MOC2, rank two, and, and so on. So what we did was we took um, these, RC, we, there were RC rigs available, and um, we then drilled these ranked anomalies to confirm that these anomalies were in actual fact mineralization. Um, we then tested the, the intercepts that we had or the, the mineralized intercept that we had for um, TGC, which is our total graphitic carbon. And then in turn, we ranked the, the different um, boreholes according to its max um, TGC and its average TGC. And as you can see here, the top 
um, ranking for mineral, uh, mineralization was MORC4. So just quickly for, for the people who are not necessarily a fay with um, drilling and, and exploration, um, the difference between the or, um, a major difference between the RC and diamond drilling is that um, RC was a quick and inexpensive technique just to prove mineralization. However, it is destructive. With its hammer that's going down hole, it um, basically smashes up your, your rocks into chip into sample chips, which you can see over here, and, and here's our, our residue. And um, that would then um, skew our, our results to the fines. So with that, um, we wouldn't be able, with graphite, it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid that you're not just looking for its percentage of total graphitic carbon, you're also interested in its flake sizes. So in order for us to get a really good idea of the structure and what would be the most um, feasible and, and most encouraging um, of the, the deposits to look at or the anomalies to look at, we then um, wanted to look at diamond drilling holes or core in order to, to see you know, what, what we could then see from our flex sizes along with the, the TGCs. So we then took um, the, the core uh, or we decided to then take the diamond drills and um, Par do twin holes just parallel to the three top ranking um, RC holes to determine the, the metallurgical properties and its flake sizes. And um, we would then proceed with the best um, area. So what we then found out was um, the, what we now call the Kaula mineral resource was up here and it had the highest um, percentage of TGC as well as the largest flake sizes. Um, this was MORC four up here. So um, it, it also proved that it had the largest flake sizes. Um, so we then started to focus on the, the Kaula deposit. And um, just with uh, regards to its geological setting, it um, is in a rather geologically complex area um, between the, the cratonic, um, between the cratonic and mobile belt. And um, it was exposed to amphibolite to granulite um, fascia metamorphism. And um, the, the graphite here you can see here is within um, graphitic schists or gneiss of the Shiano complex. So here we are. The green um, area or lithologies is your Shiano complex. And here's again some nice looking um, graphite. So that's, that's uh, really my rock I really like. Um, graphite quite a lot. So yeah, here, here it is. And these were some of our, our nice um, core that we had. With regards to the deposits, um, it was the, the Kaula graphite deposit specifically is within a, uh, a isoclinal fold that dips roughly to um, the west, which you can see here. And we then drilled um, perpendicular to it to get the best intercepts that we could. Um, in the end, in 2018, we, uh, Johan was able to declare a, a resource of 2.1 million tons at a grade of 13.4 TGC with an 8% cutoff. And with regards to vanadium pentoxide, which was a, is, is a byproduct, um, he, we were able to get um, 81,600 uh, 81, tons of vanadium pentoxide um, of contained um, vanadium pentoxide. And yeah, here was just um, a really beautiful sunset. And often we'd have some creepy crawlies that would come and visit us in the core sheds or um, while we were drilling. So if you had left the, the drill site the following day, you really had to be careful about moving your core around. Um, so this is basically just a, a summary in general, again, on, on the work that's happened. Um, again, it's just a very, very brief overall summary of the work that happened on the graphite project. But, and here I am cutting the core, and here's Johan. And um, what Johan has taught me so much, and, and there's quite a few statements that I that I wanted to share. But I think the one that that was overall was that God gave you two ears and one mouth, so that you can listen twice as much as you talk. And um, that's really stuck by me. And um, I often, especially me, because I, I I like to talk a lot, <laughs> I have to keep in mind, and and I, I often have to take a, a step back 
and think about giving people some time to listen to what they have to say because there's so much value in listening to other people's opinions. Yeah, so next on to uh, the Ruby project with Paul, <laughs> Paul Allen. And um, one of his statements was, move out of the way, scum, the geologist is coming. And again, in the car, often, <laughs> I often use that to <laughs> think of him. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, this, uh, this was when we, uh, we had just won a, a game of, of rugby, so everyone is very excited. And this was home. These were our tents that we, we lived in. Um, here were some rubies. This is our auger drilling. And um, this was the plant in uh, 2017. This photo was taken. So this was the plant that they'd set up. There's some pans and some water. There's the sort house and the scrubber. There's a whole lot of, of technical um, processing machinery there. So um, with the Montepoise rubies, um, we were very fortunate, or uh, as geologists, we were very fortunate because during the, the rainy season, we used to work predominantly on the, the ruby camp because we needed water to um, process the, the material. And then during the dry season, we used to drive over and focus our attention on the graphite site, which was over here. So we were very fortunate that we were exposed to both commodities um, throughout the year. Um, how the, the whole Ruby project started off with was there were known um, artisan, uh, we, we used to call them garamperos, which is artisanal miners really. Um, there was quite a lot of activity within the area and it is well known and well documented. And um, there, there's um, a, a helicopter survey that was being flown and Paul, <laughs> Paul used to get to go in the helicopter because I really didn't want to, really wasn't fun for me. And um, they did a great survey um, of all the, the areas and regions where we could see the um, local guys working on um, pits. So um, we, uh, the, the concessions we worked on were in the red. And yeah, that was us. Oh, and um, anyone that's, that's worked in sort of um, Southern Africa will know these awful devil things. They're known as buffalo beans or feijão maluco, which in Portuguese means um, crazy beans. And um, if you get them on you, you really do itch like crazy. They are horrible things, terrible. Um, so what we used to do is we used to be teamed up with a whole, uh, with a bunch of, of guys and they would, um, we would dig holes and, and do certain um, pitting and then we would wash the material in these um, sort of handmade sieves. And um, if we were lucky, then we used to get a, 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 um, an excavator to, to dig us a little trial pit. So with regards to the mineralization, there's two, or at least in, in Mozambique, um, the, the mineralization I'd like to discuss is the primary and then the secondary mineralization. The primary being amphibolites hosted. And um, so that's all here. This is the primary material. And um, it's then associated with these stockwork veins. This is Paul here, yeah, and um, this is him actually at um, Gemfields, who were the first um, listed company, um, or at least Ruby listed company to at the time that, that published this photo. Um, so the, the whole um, GIA, which is the Geological Institute of America, did a lot of studies on the rubies specifically, um, the rubies and corundum. And um, they found that the, the veins provided the, the aluminium and um, the, amph uh, the amphibolite had the chrome. And with the, um, the veins coming in, this interaction then resulted in these um, uh, corundum deposits or ruby um, sapphire deposits that's, that are there now in Mozambique. Um, the company that I worked for focused their exploration on secondary mineralization. And um, it would be where um, rivers or um, general uh, colluvium had just um, reduced and there'd been a collection of, of gravel. So this was a, a typical gravel bed that we were then after. And you can see that there's quite a difference in the, the ruby um, style. Um, secondary rubies, which are the ones that we were after, they are generally more rounded and um, definitely show a lot more evidence of abrasion um, whereas the, the primary um, corundum or rubies are more tabular and um, they have a far more euhedral nature. So with the, with the traveling, 
the um, the secondary um, uh, rubies that get this this sort of rounded and abraded um, uh, effect onto them. Um, so yeah, there was quite a lot of work that we did within uh, Montsapoish and all the Montsapoish ruby deposits. And um, this was an excavator digging quite deeply. There's someone, there's a geologist busy logging up there or down there rather. Um, here's me. Everybody loved using me as a scale um, because then um, if if nobody, if, if there's people on the call that don't know me, I'm very short. Um, so then your deposit looks so much better if I'm there. Um, so I was often used for scale. And here is just a close up of, of the gravels that we were targeting. And this was Bentu, he was my buddy, my geological buddy. And um, he, here he had been, we'd just been working in this pit and um, he was now traveling or taking this, um, this gravel to be washed so that we could see, you know, could we find any corundum, were there any lead um, minerals that we could then use. Um, overall, we had a, a number of different bulk um, samples, you can see here. And um, we also then did some auger drilling as well as test pits. The test pits were more, um, were, were hand dug, these were the test pits, whereas the trial pits were these um, much larger sized um, excavations that we would then do and use. Um, was the, so, um, what Paul also used to say quite often to me was nothing kills a project like drilling a hole. And um, I never really truly understood it. But now that I have been working and um, I've had my own experience, um, that is really quite a true statement that um, everybody has these great theories and, and you know, these um, exploration targets and, and it is really great and, and um, it, it, it shows a lot of potential. It's um, not very great when you go and you drill that hole and, and everyone's excited and you return with no mineralization. So that's also something that I, I've often kept in, in the back of my mind and it is something that um, I can often relate to. Then um, with regards to my onshore gas, unfortunately, um, I have to be, <laughs> there's, there's a limit to what I can share with regards to this because they've only just started um, the project. And um, I, I've basically taken the snippet out of an, a stock exchange listed announcement. And um, it was really exciting. I've never, I've never seen um, directional drilling before. And so to be part of that, that um, project was really exciting for me. And um, I think Adrian Van Niekerk, he's, um, oh, I spelled his name wrong, sorry, Adrian. Um, I think that um, it was really his, his statement often, I, I now use it as well, is it is what it is. So I, I hope not too many people are disappointed with the, the feedback that I've now given for the, the onshore gas, because I know it is quite an exciting topic. Um, but what I can tell you is that I was part of the project last year where we used a directional drilling um, uh, a directional drilling rig to drill this hole. And um, what they were targeting was predominantly the sandstone and then um, the two faults, which is namely um, 2089 and 2057. They did um, strike gas last year, um, as you can see from the stock exchange announcement, and um, they got um, readings of 12% of the helium. So, yeah, it's really exciting. And um, these were, they, so they were using a bit called a PCD bit, a polycrystalline bit. And these were the, the samples that I was getting through um, water. And it was a bit more like mud logging, which is really very different to what us hard, geologi hard, hard rock geologists are used to. So there, that's the onshore gas. And then um, lastly, I'd really just like to, to end off saying that um, 2020 was, was quite a difficult year with, for me and um, COVID really put me under quite a lot of stress and made me incredibly anxious. And um, I really relied heavily on my friends. So I think um, a life lesson that I would like to leave everyone with is um, when in doubt, call a friend. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> due to the space, I, I've only been able to, to add a, a limited amount of people, but um, I really feel like these people have helped me a lot throughout the year and so just want to give them a bit of credit too.
Ooh, that's the wrong way. <laughs> Thanks, Barney. <laughs> Um, thank you, Sarah, for this. Uh, it was a pretty amazing talk, lots of information and lots of nice, nice il illustrations. So thank you for that. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, we can open it for comments and questions at this point in time. Uh, Nolene might want to take over. I'm not sure where she is at the moment. But please unmute yourself. George. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Sarah, for a very interesting and well-illustrated talk. Is again, um, you've seen a lot uh, of places that uh, most geologists would die to go and have a look at. Um, I had a friend who was working up in northern Mozambique on one of the graphite deposits. Um, mm. So uh, um, it's the um, Triton deposit. Oh yes. And 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 he was and he he was working on it and. Um, calculate the reserves and so on. Um, but what I would just like to find out from you <clears throat> is um, whether any of the graphite deposits are currently being mined. Um, uh, is, is a Kaula deposit being mined, for example? Um, so what happened with Kaula was um, there was a, it was, was, there was an offtake agreement and there's a company that has bought it over. Um, it is a Chinese based company and they are looking at mining it. So um, I'm not entirely sure that's why I'm no longer working on it because it, it did get, there was an offtake. Um, but Syrah is, is mining. Um, unfortunately, with I, I don't know how much people are aware of it, but with all the the drama that's happening um, up north with um, the the jihadists, it is quite dangerous. So that has also put off a lot of investors. But um, there's definitely a lot of people who are interested in it, and um, I, and and Syra has been um, mining their their deposits specifically. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, George. Any other questions or comments? I've just received a notice from Nolene. She's, she's, uh, she's been disconnected, so that's what's happened there. Uh, any more comments or questions? Hi, yes, this is Rob Barnes speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, you can? yeah. Hi, thanks very much. That was a great talk. Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, um, you've had some really great experience, I must admit. Uh, just a comment on the graphite. Syrah uh, did start the mining. They've had to reduce fairly dramatically. And they've also, this is now publicly announced, um, and they've also looked doing research into trying to get uh, a, a coarser grade of, of the actual graphite product. Um, the other mine in northern Mozambique, which has, which is an old mine which was reopened by a uh, um, German company, Graphic. Uh, Crocknell, that they have, that they are mining as well. Um, I just can't think of the name of it now. Sorry, offhand. So there are the two operations there. Sorry, I just thought I'd come in there, if I may. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions or comments? Craig, sorry, hands yeah, up again. George? Yep. I'm just curious to know. Um, George, we lost part of that. Can you repeat it? I, th I think we're having some connectivity problems. George, we've Craig, lost you. Craig, still here? No, no, we we're back. Can you repeat your question? Uh, Craig, sorry. Um, you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, 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 the, the graphite deposit uh, had some vanadium in it, um, and I'm just curious to find out in what form does that vanadium occur? Um, is it a mineral or is it an element in uh, the other phases? Um, unfortunately, I didn't add one of those photographs, but um, the mineralization and, and the um, 
the work that we did with regards to that was limited predominantly to um, assays. So, but what with the, the limited amount of work that we did do, it seemed to be that it was hosted within Roscolite, which is um, from what I, I know, or from what I understand, a, a mica, a green mica. And um, that's, that's as far as we know, is, is what it's hosted in. I'm not sure, maybe Rob knows more. Uh, hi, you, yes. Um, yes, it's, it's, there is some in Roscolite about, well, certainly zero is about 50% is in is in a form of ilmenite. Um, there are there are vanadium uh, uh, garnets as well. So the mineralogy is actually quite complex. But um, yeah, yeah, that's the spread. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or queries before I close the meeting? Going once, going twice. Sold. Sarah, thank you very much for giving us this talk today. Uh, and I'd like to also give a word of thanks to PITO Associates for sponsoring the, these lockdown lectures during the month of August. Uh, we carry on again next week. But Sarah, thank you for a very well illustrated talk. And I, and I think you've demonstrated quite ably what is expected of uh, a lot of the younger professionals as they enter the industry. So I think that's tremendous stuff. Thank you very right. much. With that, I'll end the meeting. Thank you very much. And thanks for giving me the captain to, to give the talk. Thank you, Thank Sarah. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Stay well. Bye-bye.